Hello everyone and welcome to Field Fisher's end of year privacy roundup. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you with a number of my partners from the London office, together with a special guest appearance from our Dublin office. My name is Hazel Grant. I'm the head of data privacy based out of our London office. Thank you very much for joining us. My fellow partners will introduce themselves later as they speak and start each session with their own fun Christmas fact. So um, you will find out a little more about everybody in this webinar. So today we're going to review some of the key privacy developments in 2023 and look forward to 2024. We've got a packed agenda. And of course, our agenda covers AI, everybody's talking about AI, legislative reform, enforcement, cases, guidance, and everybody's favorite topic, international data transfers. For those of you who don't already know us, Field Fisher is an international law firm with offices across Europe, Silicon Valley, and China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices, and we are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. Turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions as we go along. There is a question function on your screen. We've left some time for this, and if we don't manage to get through them all, we will respond to you by email. We aim to finish at 5.15 p.m. UK. Later this week, we will send you a copy of the slides and also a recording, so don't feel that you have to scribble everything down as you're going along. And a couple of other final points, please do subscribe to our blog, keep an eye out for future webinars. Um, I know Leonie's going to tell you about our AR, AI webinar series that is coming up very soon. And don't forget our Field Fisher Get Data Protection Fit course available on YouTube. So, let's make a start. And it's me, it's me up first. And my um, fun Christmas fact or admission really is the worst Christmas present I have ever given. Uh, to my shame, I gave my mother an ironing board one Christmas. And now I appreciate how truly appalling that was as a present. Um, what can I say? The shame still follows me. So I thought we would start with a little roundup of the EU digital framework. Um, the EU has actually done very well this year. Great progress here. Although this isn't core data protection law, I think we need to just recap briefly what's been happening. So we have the DMA and the DSA. And under these um, new pieces of legislation, we have relationships between online digital platforms and service providers and consumers being regulated. It's intended to cover a fair and open and competitive market. So we have had gatekeepers uh, named. We've also had the very large online platforms and the very large online service engines named with compliance obligations kicking in in August 2023. These obligations include things like transparency, uh, user-friendly terms and conditions, dealing with illegal content, etc. Over on the right hand side, we have two data related acts. So not just personal data, but wider than that. We have the Data Act, which was published in November. And this is designed to ensure fair and free access to data, not just personal data. In essence, this is a right of access. It's also a right to data portability of information that relates to use of online services and also uh, connected products. So we will start to see um, people carrying their data from different service providers, enabling transition between, for example, different cloud service providers. And finally on this slide, the Data Governance Act. This is essentially access to public data in the EU. Again, applicable in September 2023, it involves the nomination of data intermediaries and a regulator to deal with fair access to government-held information in the EU. 
For those of you who are UK lawyers, this is like the reuse of public sector information legislation in the UK. So I'm going to finish here on my quick update of the EU digital framework and hand over to Leone. You're on mute, Leone. Um, yep, got it. Thank you very much, <laughs> Isa, and thanks, uh, thanks, Matt, for moving the slides on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, in the spirit, uh, well, firstly, my name is Leone Power. I'm a partner in uh, the Privacy and Data team at Good Fisher, and in the spirit of dealing with developments on the AI front, I asked ChatGBT uh, for a fun Christmas fact. So I, I, I sort of cheated, sorry Hazel, and got some um, very interesting ones. So my, my selected one is that in Japan, it is traditional to eat KFC for Christmas dinner. And apparently the custom began as a marketing campaign by KFC in the 70s and has become a popular Christmas tradition. So there you go, that's my fun fact. Um, so turning to E, um, EU AI. Well, the big headline from last week is that the deal is done. So on the 8th of December, after apparently about 40 hours of negotiation, um, MEPs reached a political deal with the Council to mark the end of the trilogue in relation to the EU AI Act. Now, formal adoption is still necessary, so the legal text needs to be worked on, and full entry into application may only happen in 2025. Um, there are a few key points. I'm not going to in any sense attempt to cover the whole act in this session, but I just wanted to give some key takeaways from the agreed act. Um, it takes a risk-based approach and uh, the co-legislators agreed that there should be certain banned applications. So they agreed to ban apps that um, they recognized as being a threat to citizens' rights and to democracy. And in particular, for example, um, they suggested a ban on social scoring apps, any AI that's used to manipulate or exploit user vulnerabilities, any AI that's used for emotion recognition in the workplace or in educational settings. Um, then there's some bans also in relation to untargeted scraping of facial images from the internet or CCTV to create facial recognition databases. And then as regards high risk systems, um, which include those that are used to influence uh, voter behavior, then there's certain stringent requirements being introduced. And examples of those include carrying out mandatory fundamental rights impact assessments and conformity assessment. Um, then if we turn to general purpose AI, including foundational models, um, then the general purpose AI models um, have to adhere to the transparency requirements that were initially proposed by the Parliament. And those include drawing up um, specific technical documentation, uh, also adhering to rules in relation to EUIP copyright laws, um, and also finally having some specific detailed summaries in relation to how the AI model was trained. Um, there are some significant sanctions, so um, the fines have a range depending on the seriousness of the offence, but essentially range from 1.5% of global annual turnover or 7.5 million, all the way up to 7% of global annual turnover or 35 million euro. Um, it is proposed also that there would be the establishment of a European AI office to coordinate compliance, implementation and enforcement of the Act. Okay, next slide please, Matt. Okay. Um, and if we look back on the year and the other developments that have happened over the course of 2023, um, we see that it's been a very significant year for AI developments. So in March, for example, we saw the launch of ChatGPT with lots of explosive headlines and images of the Pope in a white puffer jacket. And that was swiftly followed by um, an open letter calling on all AI labs to immediately pause development and training of AI systems that were more powerful than GPT-4 for at least six months. And that was signed by tens of thousands of people, including Elon Musk. 
At the end of March, so on the 31st of March, OpenAI were issued with an immediate ban for ChatGPT by the Garante and were given 20 days to address the relevant issues raised by the Garante before that being allowed to operate in Italy again. Um, March saw the publication of the UK government um, of its white paper on AI, and the AI framework outlined in that paper will apply to the whole of the UK. It will initially be on a non-statutory basis. It's notable that there is no single AI regulator uh, to be established. Instead, uh, it's proposed to leverage existing regulators across different sectors. And in the paper, the government calls for a pro-innovation, proportionate, trustworthy, adaptable, clear and collaborative approach to AI regulation. At the, end of a, uh, at the end of March, the ICO also updated its detailed guidance on AI. In May, we had um, a Keneal fine for Clearview, and that was a follow-up to a fine that I had given the previous October. I'm not going to say too much about that because my colleague Olivia, uh, Olivia will deal with that in her case law roundup. Um, then in September, we had the Science Innovation Technology Committee release an interim report flagging 12 challenges of AI governance. Um, the committee was concerned that the UK risks falling behind with their proposed regulatory approach, comparing it to the uh, US and Europe. And the chair said that the government should pass a forensic and targeted piece of AI legislation before the next general election. That was not included in the key speech for the current parliamentary session. Now, October saw a very busy month for AI. We saw some new guidance published by the Keneal uh, that included a fact sheet on AI. There was the executive order from the White House on AI, which laid out eight guiding principles on, and priorities on how AI systems should be developed and deployed. And we had a meeting of the G7 leaders and they met and reached agreement on international guiding principles and a code of conduct in, on AI. And those principles are voluntary. Then finally, in November, um, there was the private members bill that was introduced in the House of Lords by Lord Holmes Richmond, seeking to establish a central AI authority in the UK. But it's not anticipated that this bill will be successful. And we also, in November, had the UK hosting an AI safety summit and pledged at Bletchley Park to discuss the risks and opportunities of frontier AI, although that event was criticised for overly focusing on fringe and extreme AI. And then, of course, on the 8th of December, we had the EU um, Act political agreement, as I've already mentioned. So on that note, I will hand over to my partner, Sarah, who's going to talk to us about UK data protection reform. Hello, my name's Sarah Tedstone. I'm a partner in the uh, data team here at Field Fisher. And I've been thinking, He's making a list, he's checking it twice. He's gonna find out who's naughty or nice. Is Santa Claus doing enough, frankly, to comply with GDPR's data minimization and confidentiality, given the adverse inference for those on the naughty list? I can hear the groans and that's the highlight of my slot. So I'll carry on. So there are three pieces of legislation that I'm going to focus on for UK reform. Uh, and the first of which is the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. So there are three versions of this, have been three versions since the consultation in uh, 2021, most recently with 240 amendments in November, but it's still past its third reading, moving to the House of Lords. It makes amendments to the UK GDPR, Data Protection Act 2018 and PECA, with aims to give organizations greater flexibility over how they comply with the regime while maintaining high data protection standards, to support competition and innovation, drive economic growth, and keep pace with the rapid innovation of data intensive technologies. <clears throat> The idea is to help businesses use data responsibly without uncertainty and risk, but also it's going to look at the information commissioner's office position and make sure they're equipped to regulate effectively. Frankly, the idea was that there was a high watermark for data use during COVID-19 that saw public and private use and collaboration and it, it's building on that. I'm not going to deal with all of the changes, just some of the practical provisions that we're probably all familiar with at the moment, dealing with business as usual data protection compliance. So 
the uh, suggestions include having a non-exhaustive list of approved legitimate interest lawful basis. At the moment, that looks like will include direct marketing, transferring data within the organization for admin purposes and ensuring the security of network and information systems. There's been a suggestion that this could be more specific, but we'll wait and see. There's also a non-exhaustive list of approved scientific research types, such as applied or fundamental research or innovative research into technological development. But there's firmer wording uh, confirming that research, when research can reasonably be described as scientific research, and also that this can be in a commercial and non-commercial context. The idea is to make it easier for researchers in the UK to reuse data for further research, which, as we all know in this area, it might not be anticipated that data collection where research might end up. So there's a lot of grey areas here. Um, guidance is really needed, but the, some criticisms already of these provisions say that this might just already reflect what the ICO guidance says and market practice, but the good news is that the ICO has promised further work in this area and I will be watching um, for this and we're hoping that it's soon. There's also anticipated provisions about the record keeping, so ROPAs or data maps and possibly a suggestion this might only be needed where there's a high risk. There's going to be some changes to cookies, so cookie consent requirements. There might be some exemptions where it's low risk, for example, for analytics, optimization, software updates, or security. There's a suggestion of higher fines, though, and a possible ex extension of the soft opt-in. It's expected there'll be a change to the data protection officer role with talk of a senior responsible individual, again, possibly only where there is high, a high risk. Data subject access requests will be tackled. There's a suggestion that there will be a need only for reasonable and proportionate searches, and that these can be refused if they're vexatious or excessive. The intention is to tell the problems with abuse of disclosure rules in litigation. There is a promise generally of no repapering being needed, which would be particularly welcome in the area of international transfer safeguards, and we will see. So the second piece of legislation mentioned, I'll refer to really briefly, the Data Protection Fundamental Rights and Freedoms Amendment Regulations is, um, uh, were enacted in September and is intended to ensure that UK data protection rights are saved so that they won't be lost with the non-retention of EU laws generally. Finally, the Online Safety Act enacted in October is the remit of Ofcom. It relates to internet user-to-user -user services, search engines across websites or databases and some regulated internet content. There's a significant draft guidance and codes of practice promised with detail expected and consultation on each. So the Ofcom timeline looks to suggest this could be three years in stages. The Act generally looks at high risk content with stricter requirements on age and access to material, for example, that might talk about suicide, self-harm and eating disorders, having obligations to protect users from um, uh, um, uh, uh, scam ads and online fraud and abusive content and greater powers for coroners to access children's data on behalf of bereaved parents. And that's me. Over to me. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kira Burke. I'm a partner on the data protection and privacy team based here in Dublin, Ireland. So greetings from Dublin. Um, I'm going to go with a Christmas fun fact, um, and it's actually about my favourite Christmas song, which is A Fairy Tale of New York by the Pogues and Kirsty McCall. Now, one might think Given the lyrics, it's kind of wintry feeling. You'd imagine the song was recorded in winter. It was actually recorded in the middle of July um, in sweltering heat. And the lead singer of the Pogues, who sadly passed away last week, Shane McGowan, was also born on Christmas Day. So that's my fun fact. Um, okay, so over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be 
shining a light on some of the, the, the bigger kind of headline grabbing cases to emerge over the last year um, from the Irish Data Protection Commission. And I'm going to kickstart with Meta. Um, you might recall at the beginning of the year, Meta was handed a fine of 390 million euro for breaches of GDPR with respect to its Facebook and Instagram services, all centered around the legal basis upon which it relied on to process its user data for behavioral advertising purposes. In light of that decision, and I guess throughout the year, it's been determined that Meta cannot rely on contractual necessity nor legitimate interest for that processing. And in fact, consent of users is the way to go. Um, and so together with a fine from the DPC, uh, the DPC also issued Meta with an order to bring their processing into compliance within a period of three months. Now, fast forward um, to a couple of months later, uh, Meta found itself in a little bit of hot water with the Norwegian DPA and more recently the EDPB, which in October adopted an urgent binding decision, essentially instructing the DPC to take action um, within two weeks on Meta and to impose a ban on the processing of uh, user personal data for behavioral advertising on the basis of contractual necessity and legitimate interest across the EEA. And so in light of that urgent binding decision, the DPC subsequently um, issued an enforcement notice on Meta again, to bring its processing into compliance within a period of seven days, failing which it could lead to criminal uh, consequences. Now, Meta are challenging the ban. The latest I've heard is that they have been they have been granted leave to bring judicial review proceedings on the, the urgent binding decision itself. So that is one particularly to watch over the next couple of weeks slash months. And moving on then to Airbnb, um, Airbnb has been the subject of a couple of DPC decisions over the last couple of months, but the most recent one occurred in September of this year, and it was all centred on Airbnb's identity verification processes, whereby guests were required to submit um, forms of identification in order to book accommodation on the platform. Um, this particular inquiry was following a complaint that was submitted to the Berlin uh, Data Protection Authority and was subsequently transferred over to the DPC as lead supervisory authority for Airbnb here in Dublin. And ultimately, the DPC started they, in, in launching the inquiry, we're looking into issues pertaining to whether or not Airbnb had a valid lawful basis upon which to request this form of identification from guests booking accommodation on the platform, whether or not Airbnb had complied with various consent components under Article 7 of the GDPR, whether they had complied with their transparency obligations vis-a-vis -vis the users submitting their ID IDs to the platform, and whether or not they had complied with the data minimization principle under Article 5. The DPC ultimately found that Airbnb did not have a valid legal basis in legitimate interest um, to request the, the forms of identification from this particular individual and also that it had breached the data minimization principle. Interestingly here, the DPC did not issue Airbnb with a fine. Instead, what they did was they issued a reprimand and an order for uh, Airbnb to remedy the infringements and to effectively revise their policies and procedures vis-a-vis -vis their ID verification processes. And I believe Airbnb are due to submit their response to this compliance order in the next couple of weeks, actually, by the 21st of December. And so over to TikTok and the processing of children's data. So essentially, children's data continues to be a top of mind focus for the DPC here in Ireland. And this year, TikTok were handed a 345 million euro fine um, for uh, issues pertaining to how it processed children's data on the platform. This was an own volition inquiry by the DPC, and they were focusing on certain aspects of the TikTok platform, like their platform settings, public versus private, um, the family pairing mechanism, age verification processes, and indeed whether or not TikTok had complied with its transparency obligations vis-a-vis -vis its child users. 
ultimately, the DPC found that TikTok had breached GDPR um, obligations pertaining to data minimization, security and integrity, um, ensuring uh, appropriate technical and organizational measures were in place to protect children on the platform, with, and also that it had breached its transparency obligations and its data controller obligations. And so the DPC issued TikTok with a 345 million euro fine, as I mentioned, but also a reprimand and an order to bring um, their processing into compliance. Now, TikTok are challenging this decision, and I believe they too have been granted leave to bring an action against the DPC um, for this decision. And I believe it's due to become, come before the courts. Um, it was adjourned until sometime this month. So again, another one to watch. We might see an update over the next couple of weeks. And finally, I think it's important to flag um, that on the back of a very, very busy 2023 for the Data Protection Commission here in Ireland, a couple of weeks ago, Helen Dixon, the Data Protection Commissioner, currently announced that she was going to be stepping down uh, from her role in February 2024 after a near 10 years on the job, two terms as Data Protection Commissioner here in Ireland. And this is layering on top of the announcement that the government made in 2022 that they were going to be appointing two additional Data Protection Commissioners to work alongside Helen Dixon in her role. So now effectively the government are now seeking uh, three new Data Protection Commissioners as we head into 2024. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Renzo, who's going to talk to you about data transfers. Thank you, Kira. But before I do that, my fun fact has also got a musical twist to it um, and also a movie twist. Uh, older listeners may remember a movie from 1980 called Flash Gordon, where Brian Blessed starred as Captain Voltan and had a theme song called Flash by Queen. Well, I've recently joined a community choir in Clapham and Brian Blessed is doing a Christmas show at the Clapham Grand and because we're cheap he wanted a local choir to come along and welcome him onto stage singing the song Flash so I'll be channeling my inner uh, Freddie Mercury in a few days time in Clapham if anyone's in the area come along um, and, uh, and I'm very grateful to the AV department at Field Fisher for getting a flash of light coming down on top of my head and my video. I don't know if you can see that. Well, it's been another fun uh, year for international uh, data transfers. And actually starting at the top left of the slide, it continues a theme from um, 2022 when there were a couple of orders, if you remember, from France, from Italy, from Austria, in relation to Google Analytics, data being sent across, or well, that continued. This year was Scandinavia, fin Finland and Sweden banning controllers from sending analytics data off to Google. Um, fast forward a few months into the summer, and we have another DPC order, and I wouldn't let Kira talk about this one, I wanted to talk about this one, which was Meta finally got banned from sending Facebook data to the state. And of course, this is all because of Schrems. And the order which came about was because in the wake of the Schrems II judgment, there were not sufficient supplementary measures to protect data in the US. All pre-DPF, of course, will come to that. And what um, so the DPC ordered Facebook to within uh, five months to stop future transfers of data and within six months to actually um, remove data already transferred. Now that five month and six month period is very convenient because of course it allowed the DPF to come along. At the same time as that order though, they will also find what I think is the record um, GDPR fine, 1.2 billion. And here, of course, we got a theme which is also prevalent over recent years where the Irish DPC didn't particularly want to go quite as heavy on Meta, Facebook as other regulators, but through the one-stop shop consistency mechanism, I, the Irish DPC was ordered to actually impose a fine. Now, as everyone knows, transfers did not stop because later on in May, we had, um, so not May, May was the, D, um, the Irish DPC decision. It, it late, later on after that, we had the DPF finally declared adequate by the European Commission. Um, the, the, there were two DPFs, of course, the EU-US one and also the Swiss 
US one. The UK piggybacked off the EU one and the UK adopted adequacy for its data bridge in October, a couple of months later. The Swiss one is still outstanding. Um, no real suspicion here. There's no adequacy yet for the Swiss under Swiss law for its version of the DPF. Switzerland follows the EU and is normally slow. It hasn't yet adopted a Japanese adequacy decision, for example. Now, we had a lot of clients who had preserved their Privacy Shield certifications and they used a transitional mechanism to grandfather in their certification with some updates to privacy notice, etc., into the DPF. And we had a bunch of people certifying from scratch to, uh, uh, to ease the contractual um, requirements around um, sending data. More than easing the contractual requirements, of course, once you've got adequacy and you're not using SCCs, you don't have to undertake a transfer impact assessment. So that's the real big benefit of sending data to someone under the DPF uh, these days. Now, it isn't just Europe. They've got data uh, transfer restrictions. Other countries do. And we've had developments both in China and in Brazil. In China, in February, we had some regulations requiring um, the execution of SCCs with a filing of the SCCs with the Cybersecurity Administration of China, the CAC, very much like uh, the directive law in some member states pre-GDPR, where no longer it wasn't sufficient to just sign the SECs, you actually had to file them. In China, also, you need to file a impact assessment in relation to your transfer. Now, there's some draft regulations in the pipeline which will ease that obligation in relation to things which are relatively standard like internal transfers of HR data within a group, but those regulations have not yet been approved. Lastly, Brazil also have adopted some, well, are in the process of adopting some draft regulations on international transfers with standard contractual clauses also out there for public consultation and comment. Um, interestingly and intriguingly, um, the regulator in Brazil has said that they will be looking at whether or not to declare adequacy of other forms of SCCs, and I guess they've got an eye on the European flavour of them. So, um, lots of developments on international data transfers yet again, and with that, I hand over to Kirsten. Well, thank you very much, Renzo. Um, I wanted to start with telling everybody about one of the worst Christmas presents I've ever received. Um, and this was a pair of washing baskets from my husband many years ago. And um, since then, every year, I like to remind him of this really bad and disappointing present. And it's worked, because since then, I've never been disappointed with my Christmas presents from him. So I'm going to give you a bit of a roundup on um, sort of incidents and, and cyber and, and what's been going on there. Now, sadly, many organisations continue to suffer some major cyber incidents in 2023, and the headlines that we were seeing were really reflective of our own experiences here at Field Fisher in terms of handling breaches. So many of the more serious incidents um, that we see were aimed at either extorting ransoms uh, by incapacitating victims or getting hold of data to then ransom it, to sell it for malicious purposes. Um, or perpetrating fraud, so basically um, sort of getting into systems and diverting funds. So in terms of the incident trends, according to market reports, um, although we've seen a dip in 2022 in ransomware attacks, apparently in 2023 they've risen again. There's also been an increase in what are referred to as data extortion attacks, so these are the attacks where it's not encrypted and, and ransomed, but the data is then taken from the systems and you have to pay to get it back. Um, there's been an increase in phishing attacks as well, and they're getting increasingly sophisticated, and an increase in supply chain attacks. And in fact, the 2023 Move It attack is an example of this. So, my predictions for 2024, and I'm not alone in these predictions. Um, so, AI will increasingly be used to perpetrate attacks. Um, but we'll also see an increase in the use of AI to defend against these attacks. That said, I predict that the human element is still going to be pretty critical to guarding against attacks, so don't 
you know, if they get to start the fishing training and keep up those mock fishing exercises. So a few words about Equifax. On the 13th of October, Equifax was issued a fine of 11 million. Now, the reason I wanted to mention this one is that this was a financial conduct authority fine. And it's just a stark reminder that it's not just the data protection regulators that we need to worry about. So we've got a few aggravating factors that were noted by the FCA there on the slide. I just wanted to mention the key takeaway here is that if you do suffer a cyber incident, um, this case really demonstrates that it's so important as to how you handle the incident as well. So now I look at a few of the laws bubbling up. So the, the, the cyber security threat didn't pass the legislators by and European legislators have been busy creating a whole bunch of laws improved it. Uh, aimed at improving our cyber security and resilience across Europe. Um, so there's a few common themes across these bits of legislation. So one of them is that they are imposing common security standards. Another is also um, uh, introducing reporting obligations and often in very, very short time periods, 24 hours, uh, rather than like the 72 hours on the GDPR. Um, a, a many of these bits of legislation are also now looking at bolstering the supply chain management and security, and in some cases also requiring vulnerability reporting. So the theory being that if you're forewarned, you're forearmed. Now just delving into these bits of legislation. So MIS2, MIS2 is um, extending the scope of MIS1 to a broader range of entities and sectors where, that provide critical services. It was less than a year to go on that one, that kicks in in October 2024. And we shouldn't forget the UK is present as well, which is UK NIST. The Critical Entities Resilience Directive. Now, I wanted to mention this one because many of you may have heard about this too, but maybe not about the, this bit of legislation. Now, this is about improving and harmonising resilience strategies and plans across Europe. And member states have to nominate their critical entities from 11 sectors by July 2026. And they'll, they'll put together their resilience strategies and then the nominated entities are going to have nine months from the point of being nominated to implement the strategies. So watch out for that one just in case you're caught. And um, then a few words on DORA as well, the Digital Operation Resilience Act. So this one is sector specific. Um, it's for the financial services sector, um, although you know, watch out supply chain because you'll be caught if you're providing services to the financial services sector. That one's quite imminent, it kicks it in in January 2024. I want to mention also the Cyber Resilience Act. So this is a proposal. Um, the text was agreed in 30, on 30th of November. We haven't actually seen that text. And there's probably going to be a few years of grace period before it kicks in. Now, this one's not sector specific. It's going to apply to products with digital elements. So software and hardware um, that's connected to the internet or to networks. So for example, baby monitors, smart watches, computer games, those sorts of things. And it doesn't catch just manufacturers. It's also going to um, apply to importers and distributors of those products. And then finally, I wanted to mention the cyber solidarity. So this one was proposed in April 2023. And I feel that if Marvel created laws, this is what it would look like. So the legislation is going to see the creation, if it becomes law, of the European Cyber Shield, which is made up of the security operations centers across Europe. And these agents of shield, as Marvel would call them, are tasked with detecting, analyzing, and responding to cyber threats. That was my quick roundup, and I'm going to hand over to Olivia for a roundup of multiple cases in 2023. Kirsten, I am Olivia Wilson Morgan. I am a partner in the technology and data team. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining. So, in terms of a fun festive fact, well, it's not really a fact as such, but it is something that amused me. So in lockdown, I've got a three-year-old and a six-year-old. And in lockdown, I thought I'd be very smug and I found this company that send Santa around to your house. He's played by an actor and went down a treat. So it's now become a bit of a tradition. So lockdown, that was great. Had a little party. Second year, a bigger party. And this year, my six-year-old said to me, mommy, 
um, can we invite Sandra to our Christmas party this year? And I said, Freddie, doesn't work like that. You don't just invite Santa around. You have to be good. And only if you're good will he come. And he's like, mummy, I literally saw you pay him. <laughs> so does that mean my uh, the magic of Christmas is, is not in my house? Anyway, I, I like to believe he thinks they are helpers until the day itself. So on that note, I am going to talk about a couple of cases. So as Leone um, previewed, Clearview AI. So an interesting case from the year is the enforcement relating to Clearview AI. Now, for those who need a reminder, Clearview have been sanctioned by several data protection authorities in the UK, France, Australia, and Italy for data scraping the images of over 20 billion faces from the internet and social platforms to create an online database. So Clearview provides a service that allows customers, including the police, to upload an image of a person to the, uh, to the company's app, which is then checked for a match against all the images in that database. So the ICO has identified several breaches of the GDPR, including breaches of transparency, lawfulness, and data retention principles. Clearview were also criticized for failing to have a lawful basis to process special, special category biometric data for the purpose of identification. Interestingly though, Clearview has appealed the decision to the first tier information rights tribunal and has won. And on the 18th of October this year, the fine against Clearview AI was overturned. It should be noted that the tribunal's decision turned on the fact that Clearview's data collected in the UK was used solely by law enforcement bodies outside the UK or the EU. So note that organisations should not be relying on this decision as granting a blanket permission for such scraping activities more generally. The ICO does intend to appeal Clearview AI to the upper tribunal, which is likely to happen next year now. So watch this space. Um, Next one I want to talk to is um, Schufa. So last week, the European Union um, issued its judgment in the Schufa holding scoring case and in the Schufa joined cases relating to discharge from remaining debts. So Schufa is a private company providing credit information for clients, including banks. And some individuals have challenged the refusal of the competent data protection commissioner to take action against certain activities of Schufa. And in particular, they've challenged the practice of scoring, as well as the storage of information relating to the granting of a discharge from remaining debts taken from public registers. Scoring is a mathematical statistical method used to predict the probability of an individual's future behavior, such as the repayment of a loan. Information relating to the granting of a discharge from remaining debts is kept in the German public insolvency register for six months, while a code of conduct for German credit information agencies stipulates a retention period of three years for their own databases. German courts asked the Court of Justice to clarify the scope of personal data protection provided by the GDPR. The court held that scoring must be regarded as an automated individual decision prohibited in principle by Article 22, the prohibition on, of GDPR, the prohibition on certain automated decision making, to the extent that Schufa's clients attribute to it a determining role in the granting of credit. So, in other words, they use it to make a decision. And the German court said that that was the case. The court said that it was for the German courts to assess if the German federal law on data protection contains a valid exception to that prohibition in accordance with GDPR. If this is the case, it will still have to check whether the general conditions in the GDPR for data processing have been met. So turning to the information relating to the granting of a discharge from remaining debts, the court considered that it is contrary to the GDPR for private agencies to keep such data for longer than the public insolvency register. The discharge from remaining debts is intended to allow the data subject to re-enter economic life and so is crucial to that person. It's still used as a negative factor when assessing the solvency of the data subject. In this case, the German legislature has provided for data to be stored for six months and therefore, the court considers that at the end of that six month period, the rights and interests of the data subject take precedence over those of the public to have access to that information. 
And to the extent that the retention of data is unlawful, which would be the case if it's kept beyond six months, the data subject has the right to have data deleted and the agency must delete the data as soon as possible. So I think that is it from me. I need to cover. Super. Thank you all very much, speakers. Um, so I will just say quickly, I, I hope everybody could catch what Kirsten was saying. Her audio was a little tricky, and I'm hoping that in the intervening moments she's managed to, to do something. Maybe we should just do a quick testing, testing, testing. Kirsten, how are you sounding now? Is that any better? Oh, crystal clear. Perfect. Sorry about One. that, everybody. That's okay. That's okay. Let's uh, let's move on. We are not going to uh, go through this long list of guidance. When you get the slides, you'll be able to click on the links and go through and look at it. Um, hopefully, you'll find some of this helpful. Uh, if nothing else, I think it will prove to you all what a wise career choice data protection is. Look at the amount of law and guidance that you have to explain to your internal and external customers. Uh, so let's move on now to questions because we have a few questions that we will need to pick up. Um, first of all, let me, uh, Leone, Leone, you look like a suitable victim for this one. Um, we have a question here that says, how will the EU AI Act impact on the UK, including UK customers? Sorry, UK customers, UK companies and UK nationals. Mm. Have you had a chance to think about that? Yes, well, I guess there's two points. Um, well, the, the first point to make is that um, the AI Act has a wide extraterritorial scope. Mm -hmm. And so the focus is largely on whether the impact of the system occurs within the EU, regardless of where the provider or the user is. Um, and so it will apply to organizations that place or put AI systems into service in the EU, ir irrespective of where they're established. Users of AI systems you know, located in the EU and providers of you and, and users outside of the EU where the output of the AI is used in the, a in the EU. So to the extent that you know, there are UK companies, for example, um, developing AI, the output of which is used in the EU, then, you know, the, the AI Act will bite. So it does have that broad extraterritorial scope. And there is some suggestions that this act will have what people are terming the Brussels effect and, and begin to establish, like the GDPR, the sort of worldwide standards for compliance um, for you know, AI uh, development and deployment. Uh, and if, yeah, so that, I mean, and that will then run in parallel with what's happening in the UK itself, which as we've seen from the UK white paper is taking a more sector specific approach. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question we've got is actually for you, Sarah, and it is- Is it more data protection jokes? No, it's <sighs> not. <laughs> we don't need more of your data protection jokes. Just Actually, not I, did hear, I did hear a data protection joke the other day, which um, given you've given me that feed line, I shall just roll it out anyway. Um, and I'm going to assume that you, I'm going to hope that you haven't all heard it before. And uh, this was passed on to me from a client who said that data protection is like an onion. It has many layers and it makes you cry. Baboon. <laughs> Anyway, that doesn't avoid, Sarah, the question that you're getting, which is, um, won't the UK Data Protection Bill make it more difficult for organisations that have both a UK and EU nationals personal data and who will therefore need to comply with two regimes? Answer Ms. Tedston, please. So absolutely, I think that is the obvious first uh, question that you would ask if you are likely to be um, having to use both regimes is you will have two regimes. I think the UK, so a little bit of background for the bill at this point. 
um, it has been, we are told, co-designed with key industry and privacy partners, business and consumer groups. So we've had the regulator involved, the marketing regulator body involved, other businesses and consumer groups. So we're told this has had an eye on that exactly. There's also the point isn't there about uh, the UK risking losing its adequacy decision if it moves too far away from European data protection laws. I think when we originally got the consultation um, a couple of years ago now, I think that the government boldly said, you know, the European way isn't the only way. There are data protection laws around the world that all manage to achieve high standards. You know, we'll almost do what we want. Um, we can tell from the impact assessment for this that the cost, estimated costs for UK businesses to try and comply with this are in the billions. <clears throat> One or two billions are mentioned. So there is an implication that businesses, yes, may have things to do to be able to comply with this and we'll have a nod on two regimes to look at. I think the intentions were about this being uh, flexible, so businesses having more flexibility to comply and also flexibility with dealing with changes in other laws. So I think the intentions were wider than that and it said that although there's a cost there will be savings of 4.7 billion. I think they're estimating at the moment. It's it's all figures though, isn't it? But interestingly, that 25,000 businesses will increase the use of their data. So I think I think the hope is that this sort of feeds into the UK using data more, being more innovative. You know, particularly being sort of a research space. Um, but I think the, the unfortunate position, the implied position is that at least initially, yes, businesses will have to look at what extra they need to do to comply with a different regime, albeit that it looks like uh, compliance will be, will be easier potentially with, with the, the new proposals made, not quite at you know, rigid or higher standards for EU GDPR. So a mixed bag and we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, there's been a lot of changes already. There could be a lot more changes to come. Okay, thank you. So um, looking down my list of questions, um, Kira, um, what is the status of the appointments of the additional commissioners? And what do you think will be their challenges in their new role? Great question. Um, the latest I have heard on the appointments, uh, you might recall I mentioned earlier on, um, the government are now looking for three uh, data protection commissioners, mm -hmm. not just two. Um, and the latest that I've heard is, I suppose, the appointment process for um, Helen Dixon's replacement is already underway. It's running in tandem with the appointment process, which it is at the latter stages for the two additional data protection commissioners. So we're hopeful that we might hear an update in the next couple of weeks, um, early 2024, in terms of who those new three data protection commissioners might be. Um, in terms of the challenges that they're likely to face, um, naturally, as you'd all appreciate, I suppose, uh, coming into a new role, there will be a ramp up period for these individuals in these new roles. Um, but also it's a new model for the DPC. You know, we have three additional, we have three commissioners instead of one. So I suppose there will be a period of adjustment and adaptation um, for those individuals. And I think we can all appreciate, look, I mean, the DPC is an incredibly busy uh, regulator. It has a massive remit. It continues to be the lead supervisory authority for, you know, some of the world's largest tech companies. I think, you know, that is that is a remit that is going to expand. I think we'll see in 2024 whether or not they're going to be, I suppose, the competent supervisory authority, for want of a better word, vis-a-vis -vis AI in Ireland. Um, you know, I think uh, they'll also be expected to cooperate quite closely with other regulators here on the ground um, in the context of online safety, in the context context of you know the digital markets act and whatnot so it's a remit that is ever expanding and i guess that will be a challenge as well for these these three new data protection commissioners in 2024 okay thank you thank you um okay gosh the questions are coming in thick and fast 
uh, let me see, Renzo, Renzo, you've escaped so far. Let me see if I can get something for you. So uh, yes, of course, um, we all know the history of international data transfers and how this comes around around again and again and again. Um, what is there to say that the data protection framework won't be challenged at the CJEU? <laughs> and we will be sitting here again let's say in two to five years time, talking about whatever is the the son of DPF. Oh dear, I hope not, Hazel. <laughs> <Just, laughs> I mean, the joke, of course, is, you know, every five years you get a Shrems case, don't you? 2015, one, 2022, <laughs> yeah, so 2025 oh, yeah. then. Hazel. Yes, it will um, be 2025, yeah. Um, I mean, Shrims himself said he was going to challenge. I don't think he has yet, but we have got a challenge. It's it's from, I've forgotten the guy's name, but a French parliamentarian, an MEP, um, using some rather strange mechanism of bringing the claim under the treaty directly in the European court, the general court. Um, and what happened next was that he tried to get an interim injunction to disapply the DPF um, whilst the case winds its way through the court. And that request for an interim order was rejected. He's appealing that. So it's going to take a while, but it's going to hit the courts. And let's just hope that for everyone's sanity, it will survive. Um, inevitably, will hit uh, the CJU again, uh, I guess. So he's going to hit the, the general court and probably an appeal from, from the MEP, if not if not from Schrems himself, via, via, via the Irish route. <laughs> um, so yeah, that has the then the key question, of course, has the US done enough? Well, the US have fixed the problems identified in Schrems too. I mean, that's the position of the European Commission. Um, for I think a lot of commentators would say that they have fixed it. Um, might there be other problems that weren't addressed, or might they not have fixed it enough? Um, let us say, fingers crossed. Otherwise, it will be a groundhog day, won't it? Hmm. Okay. Yes, well, I suppose we can learn from experience. We've done it once or twice before, so we, yeah. <laughs> it should be easier the next time round. Um, okay, G gosh, we've got quite a few questions to get through here, but let me see. Let me see if I can manage them all. Kirsten, Kirsten, you are my next victim. Um, we hear a lot about ransoms. Do you think that people are paying ransoms? What's happening in the market? Uh, yeah, so we are we are still seeing ransoms being paid, um, uh, but actually, from from what I've read in reports, the percentage of payments is actually of those that pay is actually dropping. Um, but it's probably due to things like um, sanctions, so nervousness around uh, payments and sort of falling foul of sanctions, and and I think probably also organisations are getting better prepared, so having backups in place. Um, but interestingly, what I've also seen is that um, although the number of organisations paying is dropping, the actual sum being asked for, so the ransom fee, is going up. So I do wonder if that's actually as a direct result of the the ransoms being paid dropping. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, slightly different business model. So we have a few more questions here. Um, Leone, I'm afraid it's AI, it's, it's heading in your direction. I think you touched on this when you were speaking, but there's a question here from the audience. Is there any indication that the UK will adopt the EU AI Act as a UK law similar to the UK GDPR, or will the UK take a different approach? I think at the moment it is looking very much like the UK will take a different approach. Um, this, this sector specific approach that I had mentioned that's outlined in the UK white paper, I think the UK are quite keen to leverage the fact that. Um, there are in situ many different regulators across those various sectors and the, you know, uh, the path of least resistance may be to utilize those regulators in, in enforcing, um, you know, the, IA, the AI principles that are outlined uh, within the paper. Um, initially, as I've mentioned, it was in, it's intended that it's, it's a non-statutory um, approach. Um, and so at the moment, I think the way it's heading is that there's unlikely to be any uh, adoption of or the, you know, an EU AI type act. That said, as, as we've mentioned, we saw that the Science and Technology Committee did criticize 
um, the UK and suggested that maybe it you know was falling behind in terms of its the regular, you know, its, its approach to implementing new legislation compared to the US and the EU, and it did suggest that there should be a more focused piece of AI, AI legislation. So I guess it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that that's something that could happen in the future, um, but at the moment it's it's not looking like that. Uh, but of course, as I mentioned, there is that extraterritorial ter ter effect in any event. Okay, thank you. So um, I've got a question here, which um, Kira and Leone, you may need to arm wrestle between you to work out which one of you has to answer. Um, the question is about the Irish authority to enforce the AI Act. And the question is, will, the, will Ireland create its own authority to enforce the EU AI Act? Or will it leverage existing agencies? Do we have anything uh, that we know about that at the moment, maybe not given the state of the EU AI Act. Do you want to go, Leonie? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, that, I mean, there is that um, AI uh, body that I'd mentioned that's going to be a European body that will sort of be tasked with the overall compliance and enforcement um, aspects of the act but there it is envisaged that there would be a role played by certain bodies within the different eu member states um, and so there will be i can't remember the exact term it's like responsible member or something like that um uh that you know which envisages that there would there would be some kind of um oversight or responsibility assigned to a particular organization within the eu um, jurisdiction in question so um i guess you know ireland like the rest of the eu countries will follow that particular requirement in terms of what's you know what it needs to do okay thank you and i think just to layer on top of that i don't believe there have been any strong indications as to whether or not an existing authority such as for example the dpc would fill that role i mm -hmm. um, i i'd imagine a lot of people are expecting that to be the case but nothing has been confirmed as of as of now. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, quick question for you. Um, and that is, do you think that the implementation of the UK Data Protection Bill could have an adverse effect on our EU adequacy decision when it comes up for review? I think it will be um, a critical point that everybody will be very conscious of. I think the language with which the bill's been introduced, which talks about flexibility, but maintaining high data protection standards is a nod to that adequacy position. So I, I, think, I think everybody is very conscious of this. I mentioned that there's been um, co-design with key uh, partners, and I think the ICO uh, being involved in that will have had um, you know, critical input about maintaining adequacy with this. And although I mentioned, you know, quite almost cavalier statements about, you know, Europe not being the only um, font full knowledge about data protection, it's interesting actually that the changes I think um, follow GDPR uh, wording. So it, it's talking about, you know, similar format, you know, tweaks to data subject access requests. Um, you know, tweaks to the data protection role, um, all these sorts of things, but but not especially radical at the moment. But as I've said, you know, we've had lots of changes, we may have more. So I think it will be a critical point everybody will be monitoring. But um, and of course, we don't have adequacy forever. It will be reviewed, but we will see at the moment. You know, I think everybody's conscious of it in the drafting of it. OK, thank you. So just a couple of questions. Oh, just, we, sorry, Kate, just to oh, jump sorry. in there, market, market Surveillance Authority is the name of the authority that's going to be, you know, given the uh, responsibility in each of the EU member states to um, enforce. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Market Surveillance Authority, that sounds very ominous. It okay. does indeed. <laughs> so a couple, of, a couple more questions and then I think we'll move on to our trends for next year. And uh, this one is for you, Renzo, and then the next one is a follow-up for Leonie, which will be a perfect segue into our trends, I think. So first of all, Renzo, um, just 
as a follow-up to the US framework question, is it prudent to have a transfer risk assessment and SCCs on the premise that the framework itself is self-certified and voluntary? I'm wondering if that is um, a, a sort of um, a hint towards the concern that actually maybe the framework won't last forever. Yeah, I think I think that's the, the key point of the question, but actually, I mean, <laughs> The way I answer this for when clients ask is, well, you know, any adequate decision could fall away in theory, couldn't they? Um, I mean, yeah. and we're talking just now, Sarah, talking about the possibility of the UK adequacy, sorry, the EU finding the UK inadequate. Um, so there's always the possibility of in the future you need SECs in relation to a transfer where you might have adequacy. Look, a, a good DPA will probably incorporate SECs when needed and, and at a point if I'm wrong and the DPF doesn't survive, then a DPA like that would have the SECs magically incorporated into the doc, into the transfer when needed. What might not exist, of course, magically without some work is a TIA. Um, yeah. But look, we all know that the metal decision aside, um, whilst people have been doing TIAs quite properly following the Schrems decision, there hasn't been tremendous scrutiny by regulators in relation to the TIAs that have been put in place. So um, I, I, I think I, I wouldn't, I hope everyone else in the call agrees and they have been advising your clients in the same way, I, I wouldn't be telling people to, um, to do a TIA for a transfer in relation to um, a recipient in the DPF, um, but I would, in a data protection agreement, uh, put in language so that SECs would kick in if needed. Wise advice, I think. Wise advice. Um, so the last question, um, and Leonie, this one's for you, but you can just keep it in mind as we move on to the trends, because the question is, is a perfect segue, as I say. It said, it is... Are we expecting more enforcement or guidance on ad tech or targeting advertising from either the EU or the ICO? So you can answer that question and magically take us straight <laughs> on to the trends. Over to you. Yes, it, yes indeed. Um, I think the short answer to the question is yes, because um, as you say, it's a perfect segue into a trend that I was going to mention for 2024 um, on the basis that we've heard on the grapevine that there will be a renewed focus by the ICO on ad tech in the near future, following on from the report into ad tech that they issued some years ago. So I think it is very much a case of watch this space on the UK ad tech front. Um, and, uh, and continuing in the same trend vein, we are also expecting the CJU decision um, on the referral from the Belgian Markets Court uh, sometime in 2024. And those of you who, who were following this, you remember that it, it concerned questions in relation to IAB Europe's transparency and consent framework. And the questions referred um, were around whether the transparency and consent string itself constitutes personal data and whether IAB Europe should be viewed as a joint controller. Um, the questions aren't back, as I mentioned, from the CJU yet, so we're expecting them in 2024. Um, and uh, that's just something to watch out for because I think at that point we'll have a lot of renewed activity around, um, you know, to what extent uh, consent, for example, needs to be in place and how that consent um, should be obtained and, um, you know, the challenges that individuals are going to, individuals are, and, and also the various players in the ad tech ecosystem are going to face um, in terms of addressing anything that the CJU indicates um, might undermine, for example, the IAB's uh, transparency uh, uh, framework so um, it's watch the space again I think. Perfect thank you so much. Let's move on to Kira. Um, what sort of trends might you signpost for uh, our listeners for 2024? 
for children's data um i firmly believe this is this is here to stay i think it's going to be a top continue to be a top of mind focus for not only organizations in terms of compliance but also regulators not least in europe but i suppose ac across the world we've seen a lot of action happening in the us during the course of this year and i suspect that'll leak into 2024 instagram for example has come under scrutiny by a number of state attorneys in the us for uh, the processing of children's data on the on the instagram platform and i suspect that that probe and investigation will continue into into 2024 like i said um <clears throat> I'd also imagine that um, we're going to see a lot. Uh, we, we might actually see guidance from the EDPB on children's data as well. I believe they announced at the beginning of this year that it's going to be part of their work program for 2023-2024. So I guess, yeah, um, it's going to continue to be a top of mind concern for organisations and regulators alike. Thank you so much. Um, Renzo, Renzo, what's your trend for 2024? Yes, yeah, so I chose subject rights, actually, and I chose it for a, a few reasons. Um, one is that um, the EDPB has for, um, at the, you know, the autumn of each of the last couple of years, picked on its coordinated enforcement priorities for the following year, and for next year it is in relation to subject rights. So, so that's reason one. We do expect um, more enforcement from uh, from regulators in relation to this area. Um, but also we see in practice that um, you know, DSARs, especially subject access requests, are being weaponized. And that's always been the case in the UK uh, forever, even under the old under the old law. But we're seeing that more from our international colleagues as well. Um, and lastly, at the four CGAU decisions and in the whistle stop summary of cases um, we just had in the last hour or so, not one of them had been mentioned, four CJU decisions on the right of access in 2023 and three pending um, for 2024 on all sorts of diverse aspects of Article 15. So um, watch this space. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, Sarah, what would you select as your topic for 2024? Um, well, I, I will pick privacy reform, I think. I've already talked about changes that we're looking at in, for UK data protection laws. So <clears throat> I suppose finish it off with EU data protection laws. So we have, as we all know, EU GDPR, UK GDPR. I've talked about potential changes to UK GDPR. So can you imagine if there would be changes to EU GDPR? And actually there may well be. So the EU Commission, has been promising for a long time a report to re be released just after five years after implementation of EU GDPR, which would be in 2024. And they promised a report would be a complete review of the application of it. So we can expect that next year there's been talk about um, the, you know, the lack of harmony and uniformity that there is with EU GDPR, lack of guidelines, standards and legal clarity, and maybe even acknowledgement in some quarters about that some of the legal basis may not be the best. So um, let's see, let's wait for that report. We also, we've had some changes fairly recently that may be ongoing. Um, there's a closed consultation at the moment about changes to the rules of enforcement on GDPR. And um, this year, there was a legislative proposal about facilitating more cooperation among data protection authorities on cross-border stuff under EU GDPR. So there are potential changes, but potentially big changes depending on what the report indicates. And I suppose um, couldn't finish this without mentioning e-privacy. Um, so we've talked, mentioned that there will be changes to um, PECA in the UK, but the e-privacy rules themselves, there's been talk of changes since 2018 when GDPR came into force um, and, and what might be happening there. Well, it looks all quiet, actually. There's a 2021 draft, I think, that was last mentioned under any other business by the European Council last year. So showing no signs of urgency. And it's still in that trilogue process, which means discussions between the EU Parliament, Council and Commission, which will not be easy. And I think there was talk of two years for implementation even after, even after any changes anyway. So we could be years off changes, I think, there. Um, okay, I think thank it. you. So cookie laws continue as they are. Um, okay, 
Olivia, let's have your trend for 2024, please. Thanks, Hazel. Um, I think, as you've already touched on, we will continue to see the impact of the EU's digital strategy in terms of increased digital regulation. So, Hazel, you've touched on this, Kirsten, you've explored some of this regulation already. But of course, there's new rules to foster data flow, data access and the data economy introduced by the Data Act and the Data Governance Act. In addition, we've seen under the DMA and the DSA that the EU is also introducing enhanced obligations and user protections for online platform services, online hosting services, search engines, online marketplaces, and social networking services. So I think we'll continue to see the effects of that into 2024, of course. AI is obviously another key focus of new regulation coming out of Brussels. And as Sarah just mentioned, if you are a company offering IT-based services, whilst there's no urgency, do keep an eye out on the proposed e-privacy regulation. Thank you. And last but not least, Kirsten, tell us what your your tip is for 2024, what's going to happen? Well, I, I have sadly a rather pessimistic prediction for 2024, which is that um, attacks are just going to uh, massively increase. And I think AI is going to play a really big part in that. Um, I think partly because AI can be used to make attacks much more sophisticated. Um, it will speed up, you know, the, the, the compiling of how you attack if you're a bad actor. So it's going to speed that up. So there's going to be more successful attacks as well. And I think also it's going to open up the market to um, what I would call the less proficient bad actors um, who are going to use AI to do their work for them. Thank you. Suitably gloomy. Thank you so much, Kirsten, for that. So um, that brings us to the end of our roundup, just about in time to let you go off and enjoy your evening or the rest of your day. Um, thank you so much for spending this time with us. You'll get the recording shortly. And if you do have any follow up questions, please do let us know. Keep your eyes peeled for our AI webinar series, which will start early next year, and we'd love to see you there. So best wishes for the holiday period and see you in 2024. Thank you. Thank you.